Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd here in Washington. It's deja vu all over again. So for the second straight day, the U.S. House of Representatives has failed to elect a speaker, and the rupture inside the Republican conference appears to be worsening for House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. Right now, the House is voting in a sixth ballot, likely the last vote we will have today. McCarthy is already on track to lose this one as well. After also failing to reach 218 votes on the fourth and fifth ballots, both of those votes took place today after the first three yesterday. 21 of his colleagues have defected in those ballots. It's up from 19 from yesterday's first ballot. Of those 21, 20 voted for Florida Republican Byron Donalds. One has voted present, which actually has lowered the winning number to 217. Democrat Akeem Jeffries has remained the top vote-getter on every ballot so far with all 212 Democrats voting for him. He is, if we have this one present vote, five short of the speakership, if you're keeping track of that side of the aisle. Bottom line right now, McCarthy appears to be in a more precarious position than he was in yesterday, and he was in a pretty tough spot yesterday. Patience among some of his supporters is beginning to wane. Colorado Republican Ken Buck this afternoon said that McCarthy needs to step aside if he can't strike some kind of deal with the holdouts by today. Another McCarthy ally, Don Bacon, has gotten so frustrated that he compared the group of roughly 20 McCarthy critics to terrorists, calling them the Chaos Caucus and the Taliban 19. McCarthy's critics remain unmoved. Ralph Norman told reporters, quote, I'll sit here for six more months. It doesn't matter. None of McCarthy's critics have budged even after former President Trump urged them earlier today to give in, which shows you just how far Trump's power has diminished inside even the Trumpiest parts of the party. Take a listen to Colorado Republicans and Trump loyalist Lauren Boebert on the House floor earlier today in a Byron Donalds nominating speech. Let's stop with the campaign smears and tactics to get people to turn against us, even having my favorite president call us and tell us we need to knock this off. I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. So, can anything break this long jam? We have no idea. Democrats for now are content to sit back, stay in the chamber, by the way, not just vote present, and watch the GOP struggle to govern. And the Republicans opposed to McCarthy don't exactly have any hard and fast demands. One McCarthy ally yesterday summed it up by saying that McCarthy's critics feel like they win politically when the party loses. McCarthy himself doesn't seem to have any deals in mind either. His argument when he came off the floor last night essentially came down to, if not me, who? We've got 10 times as many votes, but from the standpoint is, we've got to find a way that we all work together. So I don't know who else could actually put that together. I don't think there's enough. Folks, there is no end in sight to this standoff. And as long as there is no speaker, there is effectively no House of Representatives. Members cannot be sworn in. Committees cannot be seated. Bills cannot be debated. Subpoenas cannot be issued. You get where I'm going here. So for all intents and purposes, the lights are on in the House. But nobody's home. Ali Vitale has the latest developments from Capitol Hill. Also with us, Punchbowl co-founder John Bresnahan. And on set with me here, Washington Post national political reporter Eugene Scott. Stephanie Shriak, a Democratic strategist and former president of Emily's List and Republican strategist and NRCC vet Matt Gorman. Uh, Ali, let me start with you. Uh, we are, we, we, looks like we've, we've seen this roadshow before. We kind of know how uh, part six of this movie is going to go. <laughs> So I guess the question is, I saw some reporting that indicated Chip Roy is ready to sit down with McCarthy allies tonight. Uh, Is there some incremental movement here? I mean, they've been sitting down. I think that's the thing that is underlying all of this. It's not like these conversations are new or just happening. These are a group of people who have all known each other. They all knew this is where it was heading, and they've been trying to talk. McCarthy has made concessions over the course of the last few weeks, let alone in the immediate past 24 hours, and clearly it's not necessarily moving the needle. So, yes, members that we're talking to say that they will once again meet in smaller groups tonight. Our expectation is that we'll see them finish up this sixth ballot. It'll look pretty much like the fourth and fifth ones did, most likely. And then we're expecting them to try to go to a motion to adjourn. It's the same choreography that we saw from these folks yesterday, doing three ballots, seeing not much move, and then trying to go back to the drawing board. That's what many members at this point are clamoring for. But again, the standard negotiating and 
talking to each other and the concessions right. that we think have been on the table haven't moved the needle very much. So the question is, how frustrated are folks getting? And I can tell you from my text messages, yeah. you see it on the floor there, people are getting pretty frustrated. Yeah, Ali, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, there, is there something that McCarthy won't agree to that if he agrees to, this would break the whole logjam? For a few people, and, and I mean a few people, because again, when you're looking at this group of 20, and I know that Sparks is now the 21st technically, but when you look at these 19 to 20 lawmakers, yes, many of them are all Freedom Caucus members, but they have different demands. So for some of them, the idea of the motion to vacate being set at a threshold of one, as opposed to the concession McCarthy made at five, that is something that could get them on board, but that is once again something that could come back around if McCarthy actually gets what he's asking for and does ultimately become speaker. So that's one of the points that's sticking. The other is is like when and who gets the first pick of committee chair assignments and committee assignments. All of that is in the mix here. But again, that has been in the mix, right. Chuck. Those are the same discussion points there. And there are some concessions that McCarthy says he's not willing to make. Chief among them, though, is dropping out. Well, I was just going to say that it appears to be the only thing he has left yeah. to offer is himself. Let me go to John Bresnahan. Bres, you've, you've seen these fights for, for decades. I had a committee chair tell me today, look, Tom DeLay wouldn't, make, wouldn't be able to orchestrate anything. Like, this is just, these are not, these 20 can't be reasoned with the old-fashioned way. You know, I just interviewed Byron Donald just a couple of minutes ago before we came on air and she said, is there any deal that is possible to be made with McCarthy? And he kind of walked away from me and smiled and said, we'll see. But, you know, I followed with Ali said, uh, you know, this is it's it's now we're now at 21 members. It's going backwards for McCarthy since yesterday. Not a lot, but backwards on a day he needed to show progress. This is third vote today. I mean, we've now had six votes where he's lost. He's, lo you know, he's losing ground. So I don't know if there's a, you know, a deal possible. You saw Lauren Boebert on the floor sitting just a couple seats away from standing, just a couple of feet away from McCarthy saying, it's basically time for you to go. I don't know if there's any deal McCarthy can make with this group of dissidents that would save him at this point, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure. All right, who could McCarthy back? Because ultimately, if he agrees to basically make himself the sacrificial lamb, I assume the only way that works is if he knows at least he gets to essentially pick his replacement. Is there, is it, who is it? Is it Scalise? Is it McHenry? Is it Jim Jordan? Or does anybody, is it a fictional character? It, the person doesn't exist. I mean, I think it's Scalise. I've thought it's actually going to be Mr. Scalise for a while, uh, to be honest with you. I, I, I wasn't, I never really thought McCarthy could get there, to be perfectly yeah. blunt. I thought he was going to have a hard time. I think Scalise, I think part of this is, is, is you know, as Ali talked about, some of this is policy, some of this is personal. They just don't like McCarthy. They don't trust him. They don't think he's the guy to lead them in, in the majority uh, and can help them pick up seats in 2024. It's going to be a tough cycle for them. It's just, I, I just don't think he, they, you know, they want him. I think Scalise... I think we this was yeah. somewhat where I think we could see what a replay of 2015. You know, these these same conservatives, they knocked out right. John Boehner and then they prevented McCarthy from rising to speaker. And then they settled for Paul Ryan. And I think there's some element of that. Uh, Jordan has told me repeatedly he doesn't want to be speaker. Uh, McHenry is someone, you know. Who, who they could talk to about this. I mean, he's a conservative. Yeah. There's not that animosity. He's he's good with across all factions of the conference. I think he's a possibility. He wants what to What about a Tom Cole, Brez? I don't think Cole can make that. I, I think Cole Cole would be, I think, seen as a, a McCarthy guy. And I, I Too think, much so. yeah. or not, I don't know if he could do that. Uh, McCarthy appointed Cole to rules, and right. they blame the rules committee for squeezing them. So I'm not sure it's Cole. He could be a caretaker. But I don't think he could That's be That's what I was thinking, to be honest. Yeah. The Haskell yeah. type of caretaker. All right, Braz, I know you got more reporting to get to. I'm going to let no. you do that. I appreciate it. Let me get to the panel before I get there. Eugene, I want to play something James Comer said this morning. Because in, in normal political world, this logic should have worked. Here's what he said. We can't send our letters uh, requesting information. We can't start our depositions. We can't start interviewing people uh, until we become a, a formal committee. We spent 
hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in the name of COVID. And there have right. been you know, no oversight hearings. So we want to get focused on waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement in the federal government, starting with our tax dollars. And that's going to be our very first hearing once we officially get the committees right. populated and, and can move forward. And Eugene, to me, he, this is one of the canaries in the coal mine. He is with McCarthy for expediency, not necessarily out of loyalty. You know, he's not, I, you know, I think he, he's probably, probably as conservative as the 20 rebels. Mm. But, he, but he's sort of like, hey, I want to do this stuff. Let's go. My curiosity is how long can McCarthy hold a guy like him? Well, I don't think he's at risk of losing more people than he's already lost uh, as of right now. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, at some point, people are going to go, McCarthy, you do need to just completely step aside and let's see what else we can have. Mm -hmm. But as of right now, it just it doesn't seem like there's a lot of budging uh, that's going to happen among people who are voting yeah. for McCarthy. They've been very vocal in expressing their frustration with this 20 who have come out against him. Right. But it shouldn't be a big surprise to most of these people because many of these lawmakers who've been very vocal about not wanting McCarthy in leadership have been vocal about not being fans of him for at least two years. Wait, these are folks, as one committee chair described it, they've been marginalized already. Mm -hmm. So right. the threats of being marginalized, <laughs> you know, they, you know, as long as Steve Bannon's podcast will have right. them on, they're fine. Yeah. yeah. Matt? And, and look, I, I keep coming back to the last, like, 24, 48 hours. What is something he could have done differently? McCarthy, did he make a misstep? And I, no. You know, he wasn't like a Boehner or Ryan where he kind of rolled his eyes or were dismissive towards him. He listened to a lot of these folks. He courted these folks. And I will give him credit. I think if it isn't McCarthy, if it's more of the Boehner Ryan type, there's 50 or 60 of these, not 20. But he's essentially isolated down to people who it's just, it's personal. It's, it's sorry. It's not going to be you. And it's, in a way, it's shown his, their motives, but it's proved intractable. Yeah, I was I was really curious what you're going to say, because to me, I'm thinking you have this worked out before you show up to the floor. And if he did not have those votes, I just had to learn why it. Why did from he go to the floor? Never why did floor. don't yeah. go to the floor, as Nancy Pelosi would say, without yeah. the votes? Yeah. And so. But this is kind of mandated. They kind of had to. Yeah. January 3rd at noon, they had to they had to get they had something. To go, but then we look like at some point. You're right. He's not going to get it. I don't know how he possibly gets it. So they're going to go to a situation where they're going to have to find somebody else. And they they, they did this or... all before. Yeah. I mean, they've been through this. They've yeah. actually been through this process and he didn't get it last time. And I know that was really painful. I'm sure he's very upset about that, yeah. but he's not going to get it this time. So he's putting the party and the country and the House through that, but particularly the party, because the Republican Party oh. right now looks like it's in shambles. Ali Vitale, who is the... Who's the canary in the coal mine you're looking at who's like, uh, enough is enough. Kevin, you got to go. I mean, look, the Ken Buck theory that we were talking about over on our sister network, MSNBC, was one that I was watching on this ballot and yeah. the ballot before that. I think that all of that is really interesting. The other thing that I was thinking about at the beginning of the day today is if Trump was actually going to be able to move people. My inclination was no. Obviously, you and I were proven right. Yeah. But I do think that in this conversation about what's Trump's power in the House right now, he literally created this situation for Kevin McCarthy because of the kinds of candidates that he pushed them towards yep. in some of these more swing districts, places like Michigan, where Peter Meyer once was, uh, Jamie Herrera Butler's seat in Washington uh, that ended up Luna, going for The woman in Florida was somebody exactly. that the, the, the CLF was desperate to get out of that primary. They thought she could actually not win that seat. Now she won it. Which, of course, explains why she's doing what she's Correct. doing today. She's aware but of, course, of... but And then, of course, right. And then Trump creating the larger atmosphere of just chaos, reminiscent of what he was doing in 2020. He might not have sway here, but he really is the indirect cause of why Kevin McCarthy has this level of heartburn. Because on paper, yeah. Kevin McCarthy did everything right. He created this majority. Yeah. He's someone who has the time done in leadership. He's created these coalitions. Look at the fact that Jim Jordan is with him now. It tells mm -hmm. you how much time he's invested in trying to get to know this conference and build trust there. The fact that it's not enough, I mean, it really does show the indirect impact of Trump because this is really all him. But this is a fight that actually even predates Trump, Matt. And, yeah. and so yes. the point I want to make here is that I think we're out of paper. John Boehner had this problem and he said, here, here's a Benghazi committee. Eh, didn't work. Paul Ryan, all right, try government shutdown. All right, whatever. Didn't work. Um, they boot him. They boot Boehner. Donald Trump becomes a paper over. But this this fight between sort of the governing wing of the Republican Party and the let's 
break it all up and start all over again wing of the party. And some people call them nihilists. Others would say, hey, they're just, you know, in their own form of re whatever you want to call it. Um, but at some point, this fight was going to happen. Yeah. They just kept papering over it. And, and there always was some other entity that did it. Well, Hillary Clinton rallied them together, essentially, and, and got them with Clinton, uh, or got them with Trump. Um, none of this other stuff's working now, right? With no Obama, no Clinton, the, 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 no Pelosi, all the boogie people that has been used to rally the right is not there anymore. And maybe this is a fight that needs to happen. And maybe this, they need to finish it. They can't paper over it anymore. Yeah, no, I think this is this has been coming for well over a decade. If mm -hmm. you really look back at it, and and I think you're right. Boehner and Ryan tap danced around it in certain ways. Trump papered over it because he it, the power was no he longer. He was kind of it. a member of it. He was. Yeah, he it, was sort it, of of that. The power didn't mm -hmm. reside in yeah. that side of Pennsylvania Avenue. That you know, but you're right. Like in and in a way. Kevin McCarthy's taking this fight head on. And like I said before, in a way, it's extremely unfortunate that he is the one where the wheel stops because he's played the hand as better than Ryan or Boehner has. Do they, will they die in the hill for him? For Who? McCarthy? Who? Don, these 201. The two, I would say the how many of them will, are willing to go, how many of them are willing to be these 20? These 20 are willing to do what they're doing on, right. on, with all of us watching. How many are saying, we're not caving into that crowd? I think the, that's like the always the tough part is, right? Because right. The, the, the moderates are reasonable, moderate people. They're going to find something, a way around it, right? <laughs> you, you're, you're not a mar moderate hardliner. But you, you, know? but you might be yeah. a hardliner. I mean, the irony is this, you lost the election. Your wing of the party got, you're the reason why Republicans are not in charge of the Senate. Like, it, in logical terms, you guys lost the game. Your side lost this fight inside the Republican Party. Yet that's not being comprehended. Well, but but what I would also say is, and I think Elise Stefanik put this well in the speech, is the House was the only one to pick up seats, the only one to, to win control and of the chamber. And you, and you could say, isn't exactly. that Kevin McCarthy? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And that's why I think it's, it's he earned a shot. To how would you, I've, I've been going through, I have my own theories of why, how did a Pelosi handle her, you know, the squad, and right. make sure they didn't do this to her, which a lot of people thought could happen. Didn't happen. Allowed her to govern. Same size majority. What did she do right that, that McCarthy's done wrong? Or is the squad more reasonable than Lauren Boebert? I, I actually do think the squad is more reasonable than this group, yeah. by far. By far. And I can't, I can't speak to what McCarthy's done. I, it feels like he has done all the things he was supposed to do. But Pelosi, the magic of Nancy Pelosi is that she knows everything about everyone. But I and hear this about Kevin needs, McCarthy. So that might be the In case. Fairness. And she just, like, I know yeah. she just worked it and worked, and she had everybody, including, like, all of us working it to do everything we could to But you would have died on a hill for her. Political hill. I don't know how many McCarthy that's, people would, right? That's true. That's true. The incentive structure is different, too, among the two parties. Democrats, that's I think, true. want you get to yes, where Republicans are fine. Just saying no. I think there were also that's a couple the, of... That's, that's a big difference. difference. Yeah. I think yeah. that's true. And there were also a couple of things that were working in Pelosi's favor that aren't working in McCarthy's. One, Pelosi had numbers, and she, had, she could afford to lose a few people and still move forward. But also in terms of rallying around a shared value, all the Democrats wanted to make sure that Republicans and Trump were not successful. Well, I'll be honest no, with Eugene. I keep wondering, what is the Democratic Party going to look like when Trump's not there to rally them together? Well, right now they yeah. look unified. Yeah, yeah. They're exactly. very no. unified no. right yeah. now. Right. And, and she didn't have very good numbers in 2021 and still was able to pull it together. Just like, same it was majority. Right. Exact same majority. Like, she did do it in 2021. Now, yeah. she had also led brilliantly for two years prior uh but it was also a different environment we had the white house so maybe there was you know the obviously that's a, a better situation this situation is it's truly extraordinary because it's really hard to imagine you're right this 20 does not look like they're going to budge right. how many of the 200 plus stick with them i've just got to believe that at some point there's got to be a couple of folks yeah. In that 200, they're not going to vote against him, but they're going to they're going to come right. up with a solution around him. All right. We're going to sneak in, try to pay a few, pay a few uh, salaries here, uh, cut to commercial, let Ada Vitale do some reporting because all of the good stuff is within earshot of her. But Ali, you got to go, go, go eavesdrop and go get us some good scoops. Uh, we'll let you go. Eugene, Stephanie, Matt, you guys are sticking around. We're going to stay on the story as the GOP continues to struggle to get its house in order, pun intended, for a second day in a row. Republican Congressman and the incoming Oversight Committee Chair, James Comer, who you saw in that clip, will, uh, will 
appear here and tell us, hopefully, where we go next. That's next. And amid all the capital chaos, a rare show of unity, the split screen that the White House loves today. President Biden and Republican Senator Mitch McConnell together touting the benefits of bipartisanship as the House Republicans try to find a leader. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. Everybody's making the Groundhog Day joke, so why not us? It may be January 4th, uh, 4th but it does feel a lot like Groundhog Day in Capitol Hill. We're now awaiting final word from the clerk that the House has failed to elect a speaker in its sixth attempt. We then expect the House will try to adjourn so Republicans can huddle off the floor about next steps. And what better person to talk to right now than somebody who's, I think, got his ear to the ground on this. I know he was hoping to get a resolution soon. It's Congressman James Comer, who... I think it's going to be a committee chair when there is a Congress. Uh, he's a Republican from Kentucky. He's been supporting Kevin McCarthy. Congressman Comer, thank you for taking a few minutes with me here. So, all right, now what? Well, I think next we're going to adjourn and hopefully we can conference and once and for all get an agreement on a Speaker of the House and move on and begin our agenda, I guess, the following day. Why do you think your argument, I thought you made a very, what I think is a very logical argument of, okay, guys, you know, there's a lot of things we want to get done. We can't even start. You can't do the job you want to do that you've pledged to do until you agree on a speaker. Why do you think that hasn't moved these 20 colleagues of yours? Yeah, that would be a question you would have to pose to them. I mean, you know, this is something that uh, I think long term, honestly, is going to be good for us. Uh, this is a display of democracy, but it shows how hard it is to get to 218. And a lot of those guys have never served in a legislative body before. They've never been in the majority. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't, you know, probably don't understand that no one's ever going to get 100 percent of what you want. You've just got to make your best case and fight for uh, the best deal you can get. And in our situation, 87 percent of our conference supports Kevin McCarthy. And, you know, 100 percent of the time in the past, that would have been good enough for Kevin to be Speaker of the House. I got it up to 91%, actually. I think it's 91% of the voting conferences supported him. When my son brings home a 91, I'm ecstatic uh, <laughs> these days. So that that's, that's uh, you would think, would work. Let me ask you this. Is how much of this is a political issue and how much of this is a personal issue? Well, unfortunately, I, I think a lot of it's personal. And we've got to put that behind us. And, you know, this is something that you look at this unique conference we have uh, with a narrow majority, we all represent very different parts of America. We all have different ideologies. So it's going to be very difficult for anyone to get to 218, uh, any leader, uh, whether it's Kevin McCarthy or whomever. So, uh, But if you look at Kevin McCarthy's record, uh, he's been in this business a long time, and it's very difficult, as we're witnessing right here in real time, it's right. very difficult to get to 218, but I do think Kevin's the right guy for the job. He has the experience. Uh, he certainly has the patience. We're seeing that on the floor today, and I think that's what it's going to take for us to be successful over the next two years. Speaking of patience, and you talked about this, you think long-term this could be healthy, even if it's painful to watch short-term. What is patience days? Is it weeks? Is this something? Because one of the, one of the uh, issues yeah. we discussed here before you came on is the fact that this is a fight inside the party that's been delayed, I'd argue, for a decade. Right. Maybe it's time to have it out in the open. Yeah, I think it's time to have it out in the open. I even told Kevin about two hours ago, I think that uh, they should have negotiations in public, invite the press in, uh, have ever how many of those 20. It's going to leak to anyway, public. right? It's, it's going <laughs> to leak anyway. And sometimes the, the between the leak and the reporting, it, it gets a little uh, misconstrued sometimes. But you know, at the end of the day, I would have a public public forum and uh, let everyone see what the holdup is on, mm -hmm. on trying to get to 218. I think that's the, the last option. That's what Kevin's going to have to do. And that's my I've already given him that advice. This is what's frustrating, frankly, for a lot of people. And I think it's frustrating for members of Congress. I've interviewed quite a few of them. It's frustrating when people ask me, so what's the sticking point? And I'm always right. like, I don't know. If somebody asked you what was the sticking point, what would you answer? Well, I, I can't answer that either. It, it seems like the sticking point has moved. Uh, it seems like the goalposts have moved a little bit. 
Uh, but you know, if I'm wrong, I would give them an opportunity to come forward and, and negotiate with Kevin in, in public. I think Kevin should do that. Look, if the sticking point is motion to vacate and those guys want to drop it down to one, a threshold of one, I'm fine with that. Let's move on, because at the end of the day, the motion to vacate is a gimmick. It's a political gimmick. It's a parliamentary move, just like motion to adjourn. There's really no difference. So at the end of the day, uh, if, if we have a motion to vacate with a threshold of one and somebody wants to make that motion every day, then, then you know, so be it. You know, once the press quits reporting about it, like the motions to adjourn that happen almost daily, then I think they'll stop with that. So if, if that's the holdup, give them the motion to vacate with a threshold of one and let's move on with our agenda. But if that was the hold up, don't you think that that uh, concession would have been made? Well, I've heard varying degrees. Some people said uh, it's been dropped down to five. That's what's in our rules package now, a threshold of five. But uh, certainly the majority of our conference doesn't want to fool with that motion to vacate because, again, it's it's like uh, a, a parliamentary gimmick that, that can just eat up the clock. It's just a stall tactic. And we've seen today that people are willing to do whatever to, to stall the inevitable. I mean, we're inevitably going to have a Speaker of the House, hopefully uh, within the next 24 hours. But, uh, you, you know, if that's the delay if we can have a public forum and everyone can agree that's the one thing to hold up let's just i'm willing to give it make it a mo uh, threshold of one and let's let's move forward are, are you is it your sense that we're done voting today or do you think this is a a dinner adjournment as, as opposed to an overnight one well, that's a great question, Chuck. I would bet that we're done for the day, but you know, who, who knows? We're in uncharted territory, and and I'm just right now sitting in the in the back row watching it play out. Unfortunately, I we, I was a part of the initial initial uh, negotiations, but like you said earlier, the negotiations have changed so much over the past three weeks. I, I don't even know what we're negotiating for now. Let me ask you this: What is your setup? What what patience do you have? Are you willing to do you think Kevin McCarthy ought to fight this for days? Well, I will tell you this. It, it's gotten to the point to where even some people that might not be as strong a McCarthy supporter as others are to the point, you know, we can't let uh, a minority mm -hmm. portion of our conference uh, win all these battles because this is just one of many battles we're going to have and a battle to get to 218 on an appropriations bill a battle to get to 218 on the ndaa on the farm bill and other important measures so it's going to be tough to get to 218 it's a tough job that that's why really other than uh, i guess you're seeing byron donald and, and, and kevin mccarthy nobody has stepped up to, to run for that right now although byron donald says he doesn't want the job he's a lot of love byron he's on my committee he's a great guy but uh, you know he He's been here two years. McCarthy's been here a long time. Yeah. I'm one of the, the guys that think experience matters when you're trying to whip to get to 218 because as we're seeing in real time, it's going to be very difficult to get to 218. James Comer, Republican from Kentucky. At some point, he'd like to be the chairman of the Oversight Committee. Uh, we will see what happens. Thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us, sir. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're obviously keeping a close eye on the House floor here as we await what happens next. We know they're trying to figure out an adjournment. Will there be another vote tonight or not? You heard what Mr. Comer thought was going to happen. As soon as we know, we will let you know. But up next, we're going to tell you about a breakthrough in the vote for Speaker of the House. In the state of Ohio, how Republicans in the Buckeye State confronted a similar speaker dilemma as Republicans in Washington. But they've since solved it. We're going to have the details after the break. You're watching Meet the Press Now. promised you an answer as to the future of this House vote. They've agreed to adjourn the House until 8 p.m. tonight. So a little dinner break, perhaps a little pizza negotiating, and we'll see what happens when vote number seven begins in prime time tonight at 8 p.m. So we will uh, try to get some more details on this. We'll get to our congressional correspondents to find out why 8 p.m. and why not overnight, all of those things. We will get those answers to you as soon as we can. Meanwhile, I want to talk to you about another story and another sign of how these divisions inside the Republican Party are actually playing out all across the country in legislatures all across the country. Republicans in this House are struggling to confirm a leader. Well, in one of their first acts of business, if they can ever, ever get there, they want to investigate President Biden's cabinet and family, obviously. Well, the Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell appeared alongside President Biden today. They touted their cooperation on the issue of infrastructure, specifically 
the investment to repair and replace the now infamous and famous aging Brent Spence Bridge. It connects Covington, Kentucky with Cincinnati, Ohio. Both President Biden and Senator McConnell celebrated something we don't see very often anymore in politics, bipartisanship. Take a listen. Nationally, this was one of the big projects in the entire country to deal with the crumbling infrastructure that we've all been talking about for years. And so we finally stepped up together and addressed it. I wanted to start off the new year at this historic project here in Ohio and Kentucky with the bipartisan group of officials because I believe it sends an important message, an important message to the entire country. We can work together. We can get things done. We can move the nation forward. Joined now by NBC senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, the event that Joe Biden had today is what a whole bunch of Democrats laughed at him about when he talked about it in October of 2020. And he said, you know, I, I know I'm going to be able to work with these guys. Everybody said, really? Really? Well, here you go. He got the day that a lot of people doubted uh, could still happen in Washington. And it's being overshadowed in certainly the national conversation by all the discord happening in the House. But this is something that the White House wants to showcase. And so it was uh, worth pointing out, and I'm glad you're including it in your program, to show what uh, the president and the Senate leader uh, wanted to show today. And that is their work to find common ground, as they both said, to try to get things done on behalf of the American people. Can it be a sign that more of that is to come? Well, we'll see. But certainly politically, this White House wanted this to be a sort of split screen alternate view of politics of this current moment. Uh, House Republicans unable to decide among themselves who should lead them in this new 118th Congress, while President Biden is meeting with not only Mitch McConnell, but the Republican governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, the outgoing Republican Senator uh, Rob Portman, and then Democrats as well, Sherrod Brown and Andy Bashir, governor of Kentucky. So trying to send that message and talking about an issue that affects people all across the country infrastructure. This has been one of the most emblematic of the projects, big, 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 and will have an impact on jobs and on the economy and connecting uh, two states that have a different leadership. And so it was a, a part of a larger message. And of course, uh, the, the White House is trying to expand it. The vice president was out doing another kind of infrastructure event today, other members of the cabinet doing it as well. The president just came back. Uh, you would have heard the whir of the uh, helicopter just a moment ago. He took a couple of questions, a couple of things he said, uh, asked about the speaker uh, battle, asked mm -hmm. if uh, uh, McCarthy should step aside. He said that's a decision for him. Mm -hmm. He also said on the other matter, the NFL issue, we've all been watching uh, DeMar Hamlin. He says he has spoken to his parents, his mother in particular, uh, and extending uh, good wishes for him. Of course, he was just in Cincinnati. That is where DeMar Hamlin is hospitalized. Yeah. Uh, and so he's not in a condition to be visited, but gotcha. the president did, uh, did speak to it. Yeah, I wondered about that. When I saw him in Cincinnati, you wondered, and, and not going, you would assume it's because it's just too much of an entourage considering the, the situation. That the he's seriousness had. of his health, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Kelly O'Donnell with a uh, sort of on Earth 2 uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, thank you very much. And as I mentioned a moment ago, as lawmakers in Washington are battling out over who will be the next Speaker of the House in Ohio, across that Brent Spence Bridge from where President Biden was today and a little ways towards Columbus, the battle for the state speakership ended up with a bit of a surprise. The moderate Republican Jason Stevens was able to form a coalition with Democrats to beat Republican leader Derek Merritt in a shocking upset. Stevens received the support from every Democrat in the legislature and 22 other Republicans and it allowed him to defeat Marin 54 to 43. The success comes after Marin had won the vote to become leader of his party in the new General Assembly last month. Now, something similar also happened in Pennsylvania yesterday as a narrowly divided State House Democrat, Mark Rossi, despite a temporary Republican majority, ended up the speaker. Rossi has pledged to govern as an independent. This actually happens, I'm not going to say it happens all the time around the country, but it happens more often than you realize. Whether it happens in Washington, that'll be another story. But I'm joined by Jeremy Pelzer, political reporter for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And Jeremy, it does feel as if Ohio's Republican Party, frankly, has this similar divide as the National Republican Party. And I, and I was noting Rob Portman was in the picture with Joe Biden today, not the person that replaced Rob Portman, J.D. Vance. So you tell me, Jeremy, is the Ohio Republican sort of, there's a Vance wing and a Portman wing, and, and is that loosely 
sort of what happened inside the assembly? I think when you look at what happened in the Ohio legislature, it's more about power politics than it is about ideology. Uh, you only had about a third of, as you said, about a third of Republican lawmakers actually back the winner, Jason Stevens, for speaker. Uh, Democrats took advantage of the opportunity. They saw an opportunity to not elect someone who uh, favors things like a work, right to work law, mm -hmm. abolishing the state income tax, other much more conservative policy priorities. And instead they elected someone that they thought wasn't great, but was preferential to the alternative. Is this a big win for Mike DeWine? I mean, this seems to me more in line of his style of politics, perhaps where he does, you know, sort of a center right Republican versus, you know, somebody that might, might want to have a more conservative agenda. Well, Mike DeWine is a political survivor. He's been around for decades, and he's signed a number of uh, fairly conservative uh, proposals, including allowing uh, guns without a permit in Ohio. However, uh, as you said, um, Mike DeWine is more of a kind of a pre-Tea Party Republican. Jason Stevens, at least initially, we'll see how he governs, mm -hmm. is much more in that vein than Derek Maron would have been. Talk to me about the, the, the Democrats that went along with this. You know, we, we talked about it nationally, and there would be a huge price to pay in the base of the Democratic Party for helping Kevin McCarthy in the same way there might be a price to pay in the Republican Party for working with Democrats, just how nationally polarized we are. Why did Democrats feel comfortable doing this in Ohio? Well, in Ohio, uh, Democrats have to take what they can get. Uh, with the exception of Sherrod Brown, there are no statewide elected Democrats, uh, partisan Democrats in Ohio right now. It's with the exception of, um, you know, some Supreme Court justices. And in the Ohio legislature, Republicans have the most members, 67 that they've had since we went to single member districts in the 1960s. So when Democrats saw that they could actually play a role in who's speaker and right. perhaps get a more favorable speaker, they went for the opportunity. Is there any power sharing agreement or is this simply an agenda handshake agreement and Democrats are just banking on the new speaker being a governing as more of a moderate? Um, more towards the latter. Uh, mm -hmm. There were negotiations. Uh, the minority leader for the head of the Democrats says that there was no deal, no grand deal struck. Uh, it remains to be seen how Jason Stevens will mm -hmm. govern and if he can govern more than two thirds or about two thirds of House Republicans didn't vote for him as speaker. And we'll see if he can actually pass things with yeah. A Republican minority on his side. That'll be fascinating to watch. Jeremy Pelzer, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, really appreciate you coming on, explaining what happened here. It's a reminder in these increasingly one party states, those parties are actually too big to govern. And you're seeing fractures happen, whether in Kansas, whether in Oklahoma, now Ohio. Who knows, may happen in a big blue state as well. We've seen it in Massachusetts. Anyway, Jeremy, thank you. After the break, frustration and impasse. Republican Congresswoman Stephanie Bice joins me next. Watch and meet the press now. Welcome back. Right now, Republicans are huddling off the floor to figure out what does come next. After moments ago, the House adjourned until 8 p.m. tonight, following a six failed vote to name a speaker. If they come into session, there's only one thing they can do. They have to vote on a speaker. So at 8 p.m. tonight, we're going to have vote number seven. Joined now by Congresswoman Stephanie Bice, a Republican from Oklahoma. She's a member of the Elected Leadership Committee has voted for Kevin McCarthy all six times so far. Congresswoman, thank you for being here. So help us fill in our viewers here. Why 8 p.m. tonight are you coming back and not noon tomorrow? Well, uh, I think there's continued negotiations that are happening within uh, our conference to try to get to that magic 218 number uh, and be able to elect Kevin McCarthy for speaker. Is, can you, in a, you know, when, look, I have neighbors ask me, what's the holdup? When somebody asks you at home in, your, in Oklahoma or a, a family member, what's the holdup? What's your answer? You know, I think there's a faction of our caucus that really wants to see fundamental change. Uh, they've asked for a lot of uh, modifications either to the rules packages or uh, other requests. And at the end of the day, some of these requests are actually um, incredibly thoughtful and helpful to the conference, but there's others that may not be. And so it is a negotiation process. Uh, it takes time. I have said to many of my folks back home, democracy is messy, and that's okay. Um, it may not happen uh, overnight, but it may happen 
very soon. And at the end of the day, I think what, what I hope uh, folks know and recognize is that you have a vast majority of this conference, over 200 Republicans that continue to support Kevin McCarthy, even on the sixth vote, the seventh vote, the eighth vote. At the end of the day, we feel like Kevin McCarthy is best prepared to lead this conference uh, on the, in the 118th, and, and that's why we're prepared to stay here as long as it takes. About a half hour ago, I was talking with James Comer, and I asked him about um, what's a, you know, a, a sticking point, and, and he said, well, one of them might be the motion to vacate. And he's like, if, it, if, it's got, if, if you want to go back to one member, fine. If that's really what closes this deal, do it. Is that where you are on that issue? You know, I think the motion to vacate negotiation, uh, many of us were looking at uh, maybe a, a 25 percent um, number to be able to uh, put up a motion to vacate. Uh, obviously, this uh, select group of members wanted a one vote uh, threshold. The five vote that we came up with, I think, was a compromise. And I want to just remind people that compromise isn't always a bad term. It's not a bad word. And we're trying to make those concessions right now so we can get to um, a landing place here. At the end of the day, Chuck, the American people want us to govern. They are tired of one party Democrat rule. They want to see the House Republicans take charge and start asking the tough questions, you know, finding out why uh, our southern border is wide, wide open and why it hasn't been addressed, finding out why fentanyl is killing uh, hundreds of people every day across this country, why uh, we continue to have struggles with energy production across this nation. These are the things the American people are asking us to do, and Republicans are ready to get to work as soon as we can get this speaker's race over. Uh, are you of the mindset that, look, if this takes uh, days, then it takes days. I, I've talked to some members who believe you can't let 20 members dictate everything. You brought up, I mean, 91% of the conference has been voting for Kevin McCarthy on every ballot. So, but if, if he's not your candidate all of a sudden, then they've won. I, is that something that you think is, is a bridge too far? I think that's actually a fair assessment, and there are many members of the conference that do feel that way. Um, this is a small faction of the conference, a small minority, as you said. Uh, the majority of us have continued to support Kevin and will continue to support Kevin. Do we need to make some concessions to get there? Yes, uh, and we're willing to do that. But at the end of the day, Kevin McCarthy uh, has spent the last four years helping us win the majority back. Is it the majority that we may have wanted um, in the 118th Congress? No, but it is still a majority. And if you look at my election cycle, the 2020 cycle, uh, we didn't lose a single incumbent and we won 15 seats when pundits and the media thought that we would be losing 15 to 20. Kevin McCarthy has raised more money in the last couple of years to protect incumbents and to get new members elected. And that's why we feel like he's best suited to lead this conference. Stephanie Bice, Congresswoman from Oklahoma, uh, second term. Really appreciate you coming on uh, and sharing your perspective. Good luck. Uh, hopefully it's not too late of a night. Uh, let me move over to Steve Kornacki at the big board to break down the math problem McCarthy continues to face here. It, it really is, uh, the, I mean, Groundhog Day almost feels like a, a lazy way to describe this, but it's like, here we go again. And I don't know what changes at 8 p.m., but I, perhaps pizza will change things. I mean, yeah, three hours and 10 minutes. And, and this is the list right here uh, of Republicans who've been voting against McCarthy. And basically, they've all been doing it consistently since the very first ballot, you know, with uh, uh, just a couple exceptions here. Donald's on the first two ballots actually voted for McCarthy, then switched. Now he's become, at least for the moment, the alternative candidate. And then Victoria Sparks from Indiana has voted present on the last several rounds of voting. But otherwise, these are all folks who have been dug in against McCarthy from the very first ballot and haven't changed their their tune at all. And the math is that Hakeem, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democrat, is at 212, <clears throat> 201 for McCarthy, 20 for Donalds, and one voting present. So assuming all 212 Democrats continue to vote for Jeffries, and if they don't, if they started voting present or not showing up, that would change the math. But mm -hmm. assuming they all continue to vote for Jeffries, then if you're McCarthy, to win this thing, you got to make your inroads here with the 20 who've been voting against you and that one present vote. And there's all sorts of different permutations, but basically, here's what he could afford. He could afford, a, 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 this is the range of what he could
could afford. He could have four, a total of four Republicans who vote for others by name. So like four voting for Donald's plus one voting present, a maximum right. of one in that case voting present. Under that scenario, the threshold would be 217 and he'd have 217. The other way they could work it is just to try, and I'm sure they've been doing this, but to try to convince these holdouts, hey, you don't have to vote for McCarthy. You can just vote present. Some of you can just vote present. They can't all vote present. The maximum number there is they would need nine to vote present. If nine voted present yeah. and all of the others voted for McCarthy, then he would have 213. It'd be 212 uh, uh, for Jeffries, and the threshold would be 213. But again, you're, even if you play that game of getting them to vote present and they can say, oh, no, I didn't actually vote for McCarthy. Mm -hmm. I voted present. They would know they're contributing to a McCarthy victory. They don't victory. care about that. That's the problem right. here. This isn't about some primary they're worried about, right? Like, that's the issue. It, it, that all would make sense if supporting, like, I think the Sparks right. deal has to do with Jim Banks, who she may be in a primary with for the Indiana Senate race. And perhaps she's playing games there. But... Like, that's about the only place maybe that could be relevant. But, yeah, well, there you go. We'll see what happens over pizza. Steve Kornacki, thank you, sir. Uh, Ali Vitali is back with me on Capitol Hill. Also with me, Eugene Scott, Stephanie Shriok, and Matt Gorn. Allie, why 8 o'clock tonight and not noon tomorrow? What'd you learn? Yeah, that's a great question. What I'm understanding is that this was a pressure from the House Freedom Caucus side, though mm. we're still trying to actively parse through this. The thinking, though, of what they're going to do with these next few hours, if you are Team McCarthy or an ally of Team McCarthy, is that you're going to let these deputized whisperers, so to speak, continue their conversations and attempts to make inroads with these 20 or so folks that are still voting no. The problem with that is that's what they did last night, that's what they did this morning, and now that's what they're trying to keep doing. It still feels like they're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. The thing that has changed, though, is I think that people are getting a little bit more vocal, both on the Democratic side and some whispers on the Republican side, about the need for some potential overtures between both parties. For example, Ro Khanna was next to me here doing a live shot when I was with you earlier, talking about the things that he might need to see in order to come to agreement on some kind of more unity candidate but with Republicans. He wanted things, for example, like, uh, like agreements over subpoena power and other things like that. That's one of the conversations that's happening here. But it's a sign, I think, more than anything else, Chuck, of just how desperate Republicans seem to be getting here because no other attempts to break the gridlock have worked. Well, that seems to be, Matt, Kevin McCarthy's biggest opponent right now is fatigue. Yeah. And also, in a way, though, however close they come to that cliff yeah. could give him leverage as long as they don't jump. It'd be like, hey, guys, look, look how close we are to giving Ro Khan a subpoena power. Come on back. It is, I look at that group. I feel like the, the person you actually want to, if you're McCarthy, the person to get is Chip Roy. And because he seems to be the one, he was a, an election certifier, mm -hmm. I believe. He was the one that like, look, guys, you don't have the votes here. This is not the place to do this. <laughs> Ultimately, if you could, if you can flip him, maybe, or and, and if you can't, if you don't win after flipping him, you ain't going to flip him. You know, Chip Roy's been on Capitol Hill since I was in eighth grade. Right. No, he, 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 he knows he, how this he, place works. No, he knows. I mean, he, right. he, like, he so plays the game. He does. So yeah. you're right. Like, he is somebody, and I think it's no secret that when you hear about negotiations, Chip he's Roy's be in the middle. It's not Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates. It's no. Chip Roy. He seems to be the one. That's the one person I feel like I'm watching. But the fact that he nominated Someone different, Byron Donald, Sue, and we were talking earlier. He nominated two different people. He nominated At Jordan point, yesterday, right, yes. and today it was Donald. Shows how much work McCarthy would have to do. It's not like he's an easy win at this point. I find that Jordan decision to pull, make sure... I'd like to get some reporting to back this up, but if I were Jim Jordan, I'd, I wouldn't want my name in If I was still voting for McCarthy, I wouldn't want my name nominated anymore. So no, it didn't I, surprise me that they looked for another stalking horse. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah. I would, if I were him, I would not want to be anywhere near this at this point. So that makes sense to me. When, when does, is there any moment here where Democrats should engage the Don Bacons of the world, even the McCart? Is it, what would have to be on the table in your mind that you think it's worth the potential price? You, you take a little bit of a hit from, from some right. activists. What's, what's worth it in your mind to help? 
I mean, it is that is an incredibly good question, and what what they'd be even open to having a discussion. I, right, about, we don't know that. Right, but I, which right, is that too. Sense. But I mean, I joke. You know, is it I, like Ro Khan right, is right, you know. hearing about Ro Khan and talking about the subpoena? What we know what they're going to do, which is massive investigation. So getting some. Like some Even concessions, would be a little right? bit yeah. on that probably might you know might be that. And keep in mind, they don't have to vote; they can start voting presents. Mm -hmm. They don't have to vote for McCarthy. No, I know, but that's only if they think they're getting something. Correct. In that has to be the deal. There has to be a deal that yeah. is made. Obviously, I, look, for I that don't to happen. I don't. Uh, Boy, I don't think our be, national politics allows for I, I don't yeah. think it does yeah, yeah. either, though there are some, they, 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 unlike, I would say, the Republicans, or like, we've got this 20, which sort of makes the rest look moderate. Come on. We have a very conservative Republican caucus with 20 radicals right well, now. Well, but I also, there are 18. So, but we actually have moderates and progressives right. and centrists in the Democratic Party. So it's an interesting well, conversation there. Are 18, there. Right. Matt, there are 18 Republicans in Biden districts. Yeah. Those and, are the place, people I start looking at. And they're the old bulls, right? There's a Tom Coles and other yeah. people, as we were talking about before, that we're in the delay era where things were getting done more so. And with the committee things also, as you know, you can short circuit. So maybe judiciary doesn't investigate this person, but oversight can come yeah. in. They weren't a part of the deal. So there's always little tricks you can play, too. Yeah. Eugene, is there, is there a point? I, or, I, I don't, I went through this with Brendan. I think our national, I mean, the left would go as bonkers at Democrats helping McCarthy as the right would at McCarthy for getting Democratic help. Like, it would, like, like they, they, yeah. people would lose their minds left I, and right. I was going to say, it's almost like inviting a primary opponent by the end <laughs> right. of the week. Like, yeah. people will start fundraising the moment you vote for someone in the Republican Party if you are a Democrat. I mean, we are at a time where people do not look at compromise with certain parts of the party, especially on matters like this, as a good thing. Matt, I'm going to... I threw this out there at somebody else, and I, I sort of am sticking to it. I do think if Kevin, the difference between McCarthy and Pelosi and McConnell is that McCarthy's never been a backbencher. He fast-tracked to, to leadership, and I just wonder if he doesn't fully appreciate what the rank and file I, I think more so about. he came up in an era of, as we talked about earlier, different incentive structures. I, I, I come mm -hmm. back to that visual. If you remember back in the debt ceiling in 2011, McConnell goes to Vice President Biden and goes, is there anybody around here who knows how to make a deal? Yeah. And I thought about that today as we saw the, the video out of Kentucky. That is what I keep coming back to, not necessarily not yeah. being in leadership, but not having um, the incentive structure different. Yeah, no. And, and the incentive structures for the, for the 20 rebels, what are you going to do? Take away their committee assignments? They don't care. Yeah. Right. Some of them didn't have it the last time. Anyway, right. Eugene, Stephanie, and Matt, this was terrific. Thank you. Thank you all for... Another busy hour on what feels like uh, a roller coaster, which means it's a roller coaster all day, but you end right where you started. So here we go. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. We'll see if we have a Speaker of the House by then. Hallie Jackson picks up coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.